Hi, I'm Dr. Charles Blackstock, and I pastor the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Dawsonville, Georgia. Thank you for tuning in today to the Faith Connection broadcast. These programs are recorded live at our church each week at our services on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock and Sunday night at 6 o'clock, and then again on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We would love for you to be a guest at our church and join us for our services. I believe you'd find our people to be friendly and you'd find a great welcome in our church. We would love to have you as our guest. You can find out more about Lighthouse Baptist Church by going to our website at lighthouse-baptist.com. We really hope these programs are a blessing to you today. And thank you again for tuning in to the Faith Connection broadcast. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God. the final number for this weekend on souls that got saved at hell's gates 273 can we just praise jesus for a second on what he has done and uh the the the, all the glory goes to him Uh, he's a mighty god and he wants to save souls and he wants to use us for his glory and uh he's getting lots of glory through hell's gates we'll sing this wonderful hymn together um when we all get to heaven We'll sing the first verse and the last verse of uh, when we all get to heaven. Put this away for a second. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing the wondrous love.
beginning to make more sense to me now. That's that last verse um, and the middle verse on the last song said, how sweet to hold a newborn baby. That is an amazing feeling. Yeah. And as a parent now, I know that's a great feeling. But even greater than that is assurance in these uncertain days, days of plagues like Ebola, days of uh, terrorism like ISIS, there's assurance in knowing that Jesus holds my future in his hand. And there's nothing that can come into my life that without uh, God allowing it. God is a, a great heavenly father that will protect us, meet our needs, provide for us, and we gotta praise him for all of his provision. We'll sing Our Hearts, Our Desire. In the middle of this song, we're gonna step it up a, a notch. We're gonna, we're gonna take it a little bit higher at the end. So get ready for that. Let's go Our Heart.
take your Bibles tonight to Psalm 51, the 51st Psalm. And I want us to have a little bit of a Bible study tonight and, and uh, try to give you something that will, can really help you. If you'll just, um, you may have to make a note or two. You probably won't remember everything I've got to say tonight, but um, I'm going to give you some solid truth that, that can sustain you through the, the long haul. <clears throat> you know, um, over the years, Brother Frank knows what I'm talking about, over the years, you see a lot of people come to church and uh, they get all excited for a little while and they, three, four months, six months, you, you couldn't find them. The FBI couldn't find them. I mean, it's sad, you know. And then you look around and you see some people that... Um, They've just been in it for the long haul. Amen. And um, <clears throat> part of it is is because they've uh, never lost the joy of their salvation. Amen. Amen. And I want to talk to you tonight about uh, uh, retaining the joy of your salvation or perhaps restoring the joy of your salvation. Um, but uh, I also want to talk to you about how uh, you can lose the joy of your salvation. So let's read from Psalm chapter 51 tonight. This is a psalm of David. David was um, just a phenomenal man in many ways, and yet, uh, as great as he was, he was as human as you can get. And um, here he's writing from his heart. And I believe God inspired him to do this, but uh, I believe God used the situation in David's life to help us have something in the Word of God that would help us all these years later. Uh, he said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Hold, he said, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Do you have any idea what he's talking about right there? You know, David made a bad mistake. Um, it cost him so much he was king of israel a great king a great leader and yet he committed a egregious sin he um he lusted after a woman and uh, committed uh, fornication with her ultimately causing her to, and him himself to commit adultery and um because there was a problem uh he it wound up in the murder of this woman's husband and um david uh, felt the brunt of this sin and in this psalm he's referring to God to, to, to cleanse him from the sin that he had committed the sins that he committed sins of adultery and fornication the sins of murder lying and all the deceit um, and he's crying out wash me and cleanse me and have mercy and blot out my transgression for look, look verse 3 he says for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. He said, God, I know that I sinned against you, and everything you bring against me I deserve. You are, he said, God, you're, you're right to judge me. In verse number 5, he said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth, in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And then he makes this statement, and from which I base this lesson tonight. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. David was a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> David was a, uh, he was a happy servant. I mean, you got to look at the first part of David's life, and I mean, he was just kind of happy-go-lucky and carefree. 
Uh, he's out there tending them sheep and just as uh, happy as he could be up on the hillside with his sheep. And um, he had no care but for do what God wanted him to do and what his responsibilities were. And, um, you know, sometimes we, we get overwhelmed <clears throat> in the, the smallness of our duty. You know, understand what I'm saying? I mean, we, we're good for a big job. We're, we're up for a big task. But we get overwhelmed sometimes when we think that the work we've got is not big enough for who we are. And it, it overwhelms us. But didn't David... David was um, out there caring for those sheep, and that bear came up, that lion came up, and, boy, David just pounced on them like it was, a, you know, uh, the biggest job in the world. His brothers thought it was ridiculous that, you know, David out there, all he had to do was care for them little sheep, and it was such an insignificant task. Later, David came along, and they was all facing a giant, and he was happy just to run in there. I mean, he didn't have no more sense than nothing except just to trust God. And just to take a few rocks and, and run head first into that giant, slinging a stone just as hard as he could, believing that God was going to take that giant out. And you know what's surprising? God did. Yes. Amen. I mean, it wasn't surprising to David, but it was surprising to everybody else. And the giant's not the least of them. Oh, Goliath thought, what has happened to me? This is not possible. He's laying there dying with that rock right between his eyes, his head about to be cut off. And he can't say, this just can't be. You, you know what? Uh, I'm sure David's brother was up on the bank there saying, this can't be either. <laughs> this little boy can't do this. It's just not possible. But it wasn't a little boy. David said, the battle is not mine, but it's the Lord's. And later we see that same young man growing into an adult dancing through the middle of the town, rejoicing in the victory of God again. David was the happy Psalm, psalmist, he, could, he was such a happy man that when, when Saul was in his darkest days, David could strum up a tune that would just take, a, take the evil spirit away. I mean, he had a sweet spirit about him and a presence and a smile on his face and a, a lift in his step and just, just a, a joyous fella. That's not the man we meet in Psalm 51. We meet a man that's down and discouraged and lost his joy. Would you be interested in knowing how David lost his joy? Would you be interested in learning something from David so that you don't have to lose your joy? I've watched people. They get excited for God, and then it's amazing how they get so discouraged. I, I wish I could tell you how many times I walked up to a house and visited a family and, and hear this testimony. Yeah, we used to be in church every time the doors opened. We used to work in Sunday school and children's church, and we were in the bus routes, and we did all this stuff, and it's been a long time now since we've done any of that. Well, what happened? Well, we don't know, just something, and we got out, and it's been a long time. Yeah, in the course of it all, our kids were raised out of church, and they're, now, they're not in church, and it's like the long, all this, all this, um, you know, ripple effects because something cost them their joy and uh, they set their eyes on something else to make them happy. Turn back, if you will, to the, the book of 2 Samuel. We're going to come back over here, so hold your place in Psalm 51, but you got to go back a little bit, a few books, um, to 2 Samuel and uh, chapter number 11. This is the story of David's sin. And this is the path to which David lost his joy. You don't understand Psalm 51 if you don't understand 2 Samuel 11. You don't understand how the, the happy-go-lucky boy king <laughs> could now be so darkened and discouraged unless you understand the path to which he lost his joy. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, And it came to pass after the, the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab, that was his main general, and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, and, and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass... In the evening time that David arose from off his bed and, wa and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter 
of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the story goes on about how she conceived, how she was with child, and how all that progressed into a place where David had said, what am I going to do? They're going to find out me. I'm going to be found out. It's going to realize that something happened here. Uh, her husband's at battle. There's no way uh, that she could have gotten pregnant by him. And so he brings the, ultimately brings her husband in and brings the general in and says, take the man and put him at the front lines and withdraw from him and leave him out there to die. And that's exactly what happened. Let me show you the, the fourfold step to which David lost his joy. It won't take us long, but it's so important. Number one, <clears throat> we see it said it at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab. <laughs> now you got to realize, David is known as a warrior. David's known as a, I mean, he's the, he, he's the kind of guy that uh, didn't send the general out he led the general out. He was a front of the battle. He was right in the midst of it all. David liked to be in the heat of the battle. But not today. Not this year. For some reason, David has become weary in well-doing. And we know that God tells us in the book of Galatians, be not weary in well-doing. You know, for some reason, David just got tired of serving God. He sent Joab. Can you imagine? That's like, um, <clears throat> you know, somebody said to me, said, Preacher, we got a banana pudding downstairs, and if it doesn't get eaten, it's going to go bad. And I'd say, <clears throat> um, Brother Tracy, why don't you go eat that for me? <laughs> well, everybody in this room knows something was wrong with me, right? I mean, that'd be like me saying, you know, I, I had a pecan pie in the refrigerator and I let it go bad. Something's wrong. Can you imagine as Joab is leading everybody out and all the hosts of Israel saying, where's the king? The king always goes out. The king loves to go out. The king, is a, he's, a, he's our hero. What are we, why, are we, why is he not going? The only thing I can think of is that he said, I've been out battling so many times, I know what it's all about, and I'm just tired. I'm just going to stay here and not do it. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> you are in dangerous trouble when you get to the place where what you've always done for God is not thrilling anymore. When it's not thrilling anymore. You know, um, it, it encourages me, but every year, I mean, I'm encouraged now because I, I look at Hell's Gates, it's operating, it's going well. We're having one of our probably, I mean, the reviews say that we're having the best year ever. I mean, we, we've had bigger attendance last year. We've had, we had more people saved the first weekend last year. But as far as the production of it all, the enthusiasm, the spirit of it all, it's amazing. Um, I, I, I had people that went through this just to observe and kind of give me their opinion. And scene by scene and, uh, you know, actor by actor and part by part, I mean, from the, from the parking lot to the ticketing all the way through the concession, it's like, Everything is running wonderfully. But, it, but every year about September, or August really, I begin to worry, is this going to be the year that they don't want to go to battle? Is this going to be the year in which many people say, let's just send somebody else because I've done Hell's Gates now for three years. Next year, I'll, I've done it for four years. It's, it's time for somebody else to take my place. You say, Preacher, why do you worry about that? Because God always provides. Yeah, He does provide. And, and there's some people who are not doing their place this year, and other people have taken that place, and they're running with the ball, and it's going well. I don't worry so much about the program not going on. I worry about the people who've gotten weary. There's nothing will hurt a church faster than people who have gotten tired of doing what used to thrill them. I watch people put a damper on the Holy Spirit of God. I watch people lose the joy of their salvation because, you know, when, when your Sunday school class is running 25, it's thrilling. 
But when it's running eight, it's not nearly as, as thrilling. And there's something wrong with that because, you know what, we didn't do it for the 25. We did it first for the Lord and second because every one of those children, if there's one child that we're teaching about Jesus, it's worth it. <laughs> Amen. We don't have to have a crowd. I got into conviction years ago because um, I, I had a church service and, <clears throat> and I just didn't give it my best. And I was a little discouraged because uh, a lot of people didn't show up. And then it dawned on me. We're tested not in the big times. We're tested in the small times. Anybody can show up for the crowd. It's when you can preach your heart out when it's just a few. And you never know what God's going to do in that small crowd. Amen. Weariness. Weariness. You know what to destroy a marriage is weariness. You know to ruin your job? I tell you, there's many a person that uh, wish they could have their job back, and the reason they lost it because they got weary doing their job. And once they lost it, uh, they appreciated it after they lost it. Not all the time. There have been some jobs I was just glad to leave. But for the most part, you can look back and always find something that you, you miss after it's gone. Are you weary? Have you just gotten tired? You used to be a soul winner. You used to work a bus route. Now, you don't have to do the same thing all your Christian life. But serving Jesus should never become a bother to us. Amen. It shouldn't be a bother to show up on a Wednesday night and study the Bible. Amen. Amen? I don't begrudge people that can't get out and they watch it on TV and on the, on the live stream. I don't begrudge that at all. But you know why a lot of people just don't come and watch it there? It's, it's because of just weariness. I'm just, I just don't want to get up and go. You know, it's not just the lesson that you get. It's the fellowship we get. There's a verse that says that we're not to shun the preaching, yes. But there's also a verse that says we're not to forsake the assembly of ourselves. Weariness. If I could tell you anything tonight, the first step toward losing, you know, you, uh, you talk to somebody and they're just not happy. They're not excited. They're not, they're not bubbling over. There's a crowd out there right now that's not thrilled at all about 273 people getting saved last weekend. So how could anybody not be thrilled about that? I'll tell you how, because somewhere back down the road, if you traced it back, they got weary serving God. Amen. Second thing we see, he said uh, that, uh, that, that David sent Joab. And then the latter part of this verse says, and David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now, I looked that word tarried up. And I, I, uh, tarried is, a, you think it's a real simple word. It just meant to, means to stay. It also is translated dwell, uh, to abide. But when you, when you look at it deeply, if somebody can move their phone away from them, whatever's in that sound room, it'll cut that buzzing out. Um, the... Uh, Somebody will move that phone out of their pocket. <laughs> See there, young gentlemen, y'all, you've been falsely accused. <laughs> Cleanse me, oh God. <laughs> anyway, um, where was I? <clears throat> the word tarry, if you look into it deeply, what it meant is, it meant that he, just, he settled in, he kicked his shoes off, he got on his PJs, and he got real comfortable, and then he decided he'd just take him a little stroll across the rooftop. You know what that literally means is everybody else was putting their armor on, and David was taking his armor off. Everybody else was putting their armor on, and David was taking his off. You know, he first got weary, and after he got weary, then he just got out of the fight. He got out of the fight. He watched them suit up. It didn't bother him one little bit to think that somebody else was cranking the bus and somebody else was visiting the bus routes. It didn't bother him one little bit to, that somebody else was studying a Sunday school lesson, that somebody else was packing his pocket full of tracks to go sewing. It didn't bother him a little bit that, that somebody else was headed down to the nursing home to preach or somebody else was headed to the jail ministry to preach. It didn't bother him a little bit. You know why? Because he'd done taken his armor off. And he decided, I'm not in the fight tonight. You'll never be as dangerous 
in your life is when you've gotten out of the fight and taken your armor off. What does God tell us to do? Put on the whole armor of God. You see, people that lose their joy, they start by getting weary. Number two, they start, they, they continue by weakening themselves by taking their armor off. Now watch what happened. Can you just visualize this? Everybody else has put the armor on. They're headed out to battle. And David's, he's kicked his boots off. He's taken off the breastplate. He's took his sword and laid it over in the corner. The helmet's up on the, the helmet rack and, and everything else. And as soon as he gets everything off and gets real comfortable, what does he decide to do? Go take a walk on the roof. I doubt very soon if he climbed up on the roof with all that metal. Because you see him clang, 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 clang. No, no, he had to get all the armor off. And the next thing he did was make the biggest mistake of his life. You, you with me tonight? I'm just trying to teach you something. I can't, I can't open your skull up and pour it into it, but I can show you the Word of God tonight. You see, you first got, you know, singing the song wasn't enough. You know, now you've now you got to have something more. <laughs> you see, what happens is this. You used to get excited singing the songs about Jesus. And then you had to turn to, to where somebody else was singing them for you, entertaining you. I may not be you, but I'm just talking about people in general. David used to be excited going to battle, but now somebody's got to go to battle for him. And then... He weakened himself. And we weaken ourselves when we lay our armor down. We weaken ourselves when we decide that we're not going to, I don't have to study my Bible anymore. I don't have to pray like I used to. By the way, when you're going to battle, you're going to have to have a sword that's just ready to be used. When you're going to battle, you know how to pray and get a hold of the horns of the altar because you know the enemy's coming. But when you have taken your armor off, the prayer life is not as important. The Bible study is not as important. Uh, uh, all, the, all the things that, um, that kept you sharp and kept you strong, now you've weakened yourself. Amen. You'll never be so weak as when you forsake the battlefield. I don't know what it is, but I, I, I'll tell you this. The devil, you, you think, preacher, well, you got the place where the devil doesn't bother you. Ah, uh, don't you believe that? Don't you believe that? He fights me, and he, 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 he attacks me just as much as he ever has. But I'll tell you one thing. It keeps me strong. Hell's Gates keeps me strong. You know what? I, 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 I know that we're going we're gonna to be battling the devil next weekend. I can't afford to let down and not pray. I can't afford to let down and, and just indulge the flesh. I can't afford. I, I, I know that uh, Friday night's coming. I know Saturday night's coming. I know Sunday morning's coming. And I've got to stand in this pulpit and preach the Word of God. And, and I, I can't afford to just slack off. Uh, you know, when you don't have any job to do, when you don't have any battles to fight, when you're, not, when you're just coasting, all the really things, the things that really make you strong are not that important to you. But when you know you're going to be on the front line come morning, you'll spend the night in prayer. When you know you're going to be on the front line come morning, you're sharpening your sword. When you're come to, going to be on the front line the next morning, you're, you're checking your armor to make sure that it's good to go. Amen? Amen. But when you're sitting at home with your armor kicked off, it's real easy just to stroll across the rooftop and get yourself into more trouble than you could ever dream you'd, you'd ever done. All because you weakened yourself. I don't know what it is about this, but I'm just, I promise you, after 30 something years of being a Christian, after 20 years, some 20 something years of being in the ministry, after watching great men, watching, you know, not, you say, well, you're talking about great preachers that you've been around. Yeah, you know, I, I went to Israel. And hobnob with a pastor of the largest independent Baptist church in the, in, the, in the world. You say, well, he was a great man. No, he's in jail right now. A great man's a man sitting right over there that's, you know, that's still putting his armor on every day. Amen. I'm just saying, one thing I've learned is get you a job and do it. And don't quit it unless you trade up 
or unless you unless somebody you needed somewhere else. Don't decide to send everybody else to battle. Don't let everybody else work the bus route and you stay home. Don't let everybody else work the Sunday school and you quit. Don't, don't give up your job and your duty because when you do, the next thing you do is you take your armor off and you've never been so weak as when you decided not to go to battle. Amen. Third thing I see, as soon as he took, took his armor off, he weakened himself, and the next thing he did, he became as worldly as anybody else. And David went on the roof, and he saw a woman. Anybody could glance upon something they're not supposed to see. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Oh, now, now he's looking upon her. And then it said, and David inquired after the woman. He's lusted. A, a look has become a lust. And then before he knew it, he had lost everything dear to him. You know why? Because when he got weakened, he became just as worldly as any other man. I'm just telling you right now, there's no difference between me and you and anybody else in this world except the Holy Spirit of God in our life. I'm not, I'm not a bit stronger than a pedophile. I'm not a bit stronger than an alcoholic. I'm not a bit stronger than a man committing fornication tonight. I'm not a bit stronger. You know what the difference is? It's, it's God in us. It's God in us. And the moment you think that you can do it on your own is when you, listen, you are in grave danger because we're just as worldly as anybody could be except for, what did Paul say? I am what I am by the grace of God. It's that power of God working in me that makes the difference. And, and when David took his armor off, he weakened himself. He walked away from what, what God had called him to do, and he became just as worldly. It's amazing. I watch this. I watch this. Man, I, you see, so... A person will quit their job. And the next thing I see them do is out there sinning as worldly as anybody. Isn't that true, Brother Frank? You'll watch it. Uh, soon they, they'll quit their job. It may, it, may be, it may be sweeping the floor. It may be keep watching the babies. It may be running the bus route. It may be anything in the church. They quit. They let somebody else go to battle. They take their armor off. And next thing you watch, they're doing things that you, they, you know, they just start doing what lost people do. What lost people do on Sundays? Sleep in. Isn't that what happens? Quit their job one Sunday, sleep in the next. Quit their job, what do they do next? Start watching things they shouldn't watch. They give up God's music and trade it for the world's music. It just goes down that road. The only people I'm telling you, you know, I've taught this for years and years and years, and, I, and I, you know, and I know it's true. What keeps young people on the right track? It's not a youth group that takes them to every activity that they can go to, every, every piece of entertainment. I think there's a place for going to Six Flags and a place for going to Whitewater Rafts, and I think there's a place for all the fun things that a youth group can do. But when they turn 18 or whatever it is and they graduate high school, the difference between that young person walking away and going their own direction and staying with God is that during those teenage years, if they found a place of service, if they found a place to serve. That's why it thrills me to see a young lady playing the piano, a young lady singing a song. You know why? Because she's, they found something to do for God. And, and when, you know what, when you do that, it's a joy that nothing else can compare. And when you've got that joy and you just keep doing your job and you keep getting your blessing and you keep living for God, why in the world would you want what the world's got? Why would you want to go get drunk? Why would you want to go do the things they're doing? The, the best deterrent to worldliness <laughs> is serving God. So they, they get weary. They take their armor off and they become weak. And the next thing he does is he becomes as worldly and starts doing exactly what a lost person would do. If you'd have asked David, David, would you ever commit adultery and murder? And David would say, no way, I'm a man after God's own heart. But once he took his armor off, it's like Samson's getting his hair cut. He was just as weak as any other man. You know what that hair represented? It was his calling. 
It was what God called Samson to do. God said, I, don't let your hair, get, don't, don't cut your hair, let it grow, and I'm going to use you for something great. And when he cut his hair, he, he, looked, he, forsake, he forsook his calling. And when you leave your job, you're becoming, you're going to be as weak as any other man, and then you'll do the things that lost people do. And the last thing we see is his worldliness turned to wickedness. Not only did he do what lost people do, but he did stuff he never dreamed that anybody should do. He stole a man's wife and had him murdered. I watch people do stuff that they never dreamed they'd do. I watch people sink to depths that they never thought they could sink to. You see, weariness turns to weakness. Weakness turns to worldliness. And worldliness turns to wickedness. And people will do things to each other and hurt each other. Sometimes it may not be a gun or a knife. It may not be um, a sexual sin. It may just be the words. You know, one of the things that they taught you as a kid is the biggest lie I've ever heard. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's about the biggest lie you'll ever be heard. Words will hurt people like nothing else will. And I've seen people get as wicked with their mouth. I mean, just say things and hurt people and, and ruin churches and split things up. I've just seen damage done. I, I've seen people do stuff to preachers by making accusations that wasn't true. And I've seen people hurt good people in church uh, just because of their the wickedness. And you know where they are? Now, I'll tell you this right now. You watch. That wicked person, that worldly person, Wicked person. You know what they are? They're the most unhappy person you'll ever meet. They're not happy. With that. No matter where they go, something's wrong. No matter what they do, it's not good enough. No matter who loves them, they don't love them enough. They're the most unhappy person. You know why? They have no joy of the Lord. And how do they lose their joy? Well, they, their wickedness. You can't be happy living in sin. I mean, there's no joy. There may be some pleasure in sin for a season, but there's no joy in it. Their worldliness that they thought would just make them happy it didn't make them happy. Where did it come from, though? It came from the weakness. They never thought they'd ever go that route. They never thought that they'd be that place. They never thought that they'd get out of church. They never thought they, they, never thought they could get that weak. Where did it all begin? Weariness. Just getting tired. How could you get tired of serving the King of kings and Lord of lords? How could you get tired of singing the songs of Zion? How could you get tired of seeing people saved? How could you get tired of watching kids get on a bus? How could you get tired of teaching boys and girls in a Sunday school class? How could you get tired? But people do all the time. And there's a there's hundred churches out there right now that you can go to. You know what it is? It's full of tired people that don't want to do it anymore. So they're Paying somebody else to do it. Paying somebody else to sing. Put some money in the offering plate so they got, a, they got paid performers. They got paid staff. They don't have to teach. They don't have to visit. They don't do All they can do is just sit back because they got weary. But I promise you something. They're not happy. That's why when you see that same crowd on Sundays that goes to that big fancy contemporary church, you can also find them. I don't recommend you go looking for them, but you can also find them on Friday, Saturday night at the watering hole, drinking and dancing and trying to get over what, the, you know, it's the misery in their life. I know what I'm talking about because I see their Facebook pictures. Would you like to see how David restored the joy of his salvation? How he got it back? There's three simple things. Go back to Psalm 51. And I, we, we found how he lost it by weariness that led to weakness that led to worldliness, that led to wickedness. I made it simple enough for you to remember four words. Now I'm giving you three words to start with C, how to get it back. How to keep it, by the way. Because all of us have to go through these steps if we're going to keep the joy of the Lord. In verse number three, David said, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. David got his joy back first by confession. He got his joy back, number one, by confession. The question would have been asked to David, David, where did you lose your joy? And David said, hmm. Well, you know, Absalom, boy, he caused me a lot of grief. 
nah, I lost it before that. Yeah, you know, um, man, my daughter, uh, you know, my other son, boy, he raped her. Boy, that was a miserable time in my life. No, it happened before that. Well, boy, it was a dark night. That little baby died. No, it happened before that. Where'd you lose your joy of your salvation, David? I lost it that night on a rooftop. That's where I lost it. When I looked on a woman and lusted after her, that's where I lost it. That's where you go back to and you get on your knees and you say, Dear God, I confess my sin. That's where I lost the joy. You know, we want to blame our joy, our lost joy on everybody else. The, the, you know, the preacher just doesn't preach good message anymore. Well, you know what? If you're from around here, he never did. Except when Brother Frank's preaching. You know, I'm just saying. You know, well, the, the singers, don't, they, just don't, they just don't have the same punch as they used to have. Yeah? I'd like to punch you. <laughs> In the Lord. You know, just for the, your edification. Um, no, it's not that. It's not that the singers don't have the same zeal. It's not the preachers got messages that aren't, you know. I hear people say, well, I, I just think I, I need a little, little deeper message. You're drowning in what I've been giving you. I mean, seriously. I just want a little more spiritual song service. Well, you're not singing anyway. You're just sitting there staring at them. What do you think, you know? What did Jesus say? You know, I piped into you, and you have it sung. You know, no matter what I do, you're not going to be happy. No, you know what, people? You lose your joy, first of all, because there's sin in your life. Not always, but hey, sin will cause you to lose your joy. And go back to the place where you lost it and just say honestly before God, God, I know I got weary. I got weary, and, then I, and in my weakness, I started living like a lost person, and before I knew it, I did things I never dreamed I would do. God, I'm sorry. So where did David sin? I don't know what he's confessing. I mean, you can, you can look at it. He said, my sin is ever before me. Was it the sin of murdering Uriah, the Hittite? Or was it the sin of committing fornication and adultery with Bathsheba? Or was it the sin of just not being happy about doing what he'd always done, the weariness that came into his life? God commanded us, be not weary in well-doing. Don't get tired of doing good things. And maybe it was just the sin of David saying, I am, I'm tired of going to battle. I'm just going to stay home. Maybe that's where it all began. But he, he got to a place of confession. And then he went to verse number 7 here, and I'm skipping around for sake of time. He said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And he said, God, I admit that I've done wrong. I'm making a confession, and now I want some cleansing. <laughs> what does God need to wash, in our, wash from our life? Now, now, you, now, now, watch what I'm saying here. So, if, if you take your sin back to that weary place when God's not enough anymore, when the songs of Zion are not enough anymore, when sowing is not enough anymore, when preaching is not enough anymore, and you get tired of your Sunday school class is not enough or your bus route's not enough or, or winning souls is not enough or whatever it is that you've been doing, or, all right, you, you, you go back to that weariness. What does weariness lead to? Weakness. What does weakness lead to? Worldliness. So once you confess the weariness... You're going to have to let God clean out the worldliness. Amen? Because all that stuff that's got cluttered in David's life. I wonder how many times David went back on that roof before he got right with God and started looking and saying, I wonder if there's any other women out there that I can see. You see, David may not have had an internet, but he had the same problem. Amen. 
wanting to get on there and look and see what he could see. I wonder. You see, we, we kind of just gloss over the fact that David had a lot of wives when it was never the will of God for David to have all them wives. It caused him a lot of grief. It caused his son a lot of grief. There's a lot of worldly things that clutter up in our life. Amen. When you want to get your joy back, you're going to have to be willing. Do you remember when you first got saved and first got in church? For some of you, that may not have been that long ago. And you probably still, you still got a joy about you. And, you know, you, 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 you took notes in the preaching and you sang every song and you're trying to learn all the words. And, and it was just like you thought everybody in the church just loved Jesus. <laughs> you remember those days? You know, well, there's a lot of people in church that do love Jesus. Amen. But then as time goes on, if you're not careful, it becomes such a routine and such a thing that you do out of habit. You can sing the song without even thinking about it. One of the things that I like about singing new songs is you've got you to learn new words. I mean, I love Victory in Jesus. It's a wonderful song. But you know what? I can do two things and sing Victory in Jesus and never miss a beat. I don't want to, but I can. You know why? Because I've sung it so many times. It's real easy for me and for you to sing some songs and never think about anything. Matter of fact, your mind's already thinking about something else. Oh, victory in Jesus. You're thinking about something totally different. Can I get a witness? It's good to sing something new. You know why? Because you have to concentrate on what you're singing. What good does it do to... I'm not saying chunk out all the old songs, but I'm saying, you know, it does us no benefit to sing something if our heart's not in it, if our mind's not with it. And so to get our joy back, we need not only confession, but we need cleansing. We need to let the Lord clean out a bunch of stuff that's cluttered up our lives. Now, you may judge me because I had my phone in my pocket, but I tell you what I was doing up there. I take notes all the time. This has this become my little notebook. And I, and I got a sermon outline sitting on the front row just thinking about a song we're singing. I'm serious. I jot it. If you, if you, you don't doubt me, you doubt me, I'll, I'll let you look at it after service. I, I jot it down. I've got a good sermon right there just sitting on the front row, standing on the front row. But you know what? That's different between somebody taking notes on the phone and somebody texting their buddies while the church service is going on. There need to be some cleaning out about that kind of stuff. Amen. You don't have that much time to be in church all your life. You just got a very precious amount of very few minutes to be in church and get something from a, from a preacher, from a, a worship service, you've got very little time to get something from God in a church service, and you're going to sit there and, and doodle your way through it and text your way through it, and, and, you know, and I'm preaching to everybody, everybody staring at me, and I appreciate that because I get good attention, but you know, um, somebody may listen to this one day, and, and it, it'll get under conviction. Amen. I'm not preaching to y'all. <laughs> Miss Violet's back here texting on her phone. <laughs> She's been searching the internet. <laughs> uh, what does God need to wash from our lives so that we can have His joy again? Remember when we got, first got saved and, and everything was so fresh and everything? You know, it's just, it was just God that we wanted, wasn't it? It was just, you know, there, there were so other, other things that just, just paled in comparison. It was just, it was just God and, and the Bible and, and, and it was so thrilling just to be a child of God. And then somehow or another we got tired of that. And then our world started cluttering up full of worldly things. You know how you got that new house and it was so, you know, the carpet smelled new. Amen. And you know, the walls were bare and it didn't matter. It didn't have a whole lot of furniture. It didn't matter. You're just, you're just glad to have a home. Amen. Now you can't even walk through the place. So cluttered, amen. You got enough to you got enough to outfit any four houses. Can I get a witness? You know what? That's the way our lives get. When we first get Jesus, He's just enough. And before we know it, we're so cluttered with so many things that we can't even see the house anymore. Amen. What we need is to let God clean out some of this stuff. And when you, when, you, when you start cleaning things back out, you could, you know, wow, we got a garage in here. Man, we, we've actually got a living room. <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. 
I'm just saying. Confession should lead to cleansing. What did David say? Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. What does God need to wash from our lives that we might be joyful again? It's amazing how the sins of this world clutter up our lives and choke out the joy of the Lord. And the last thing we see in verse 13, he said, Then I will teach, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You know, David learned something that if we're going to serve God, we need to serve him with clean hands and a pure heart. David knew something. He, even in his, in his days of backsliding, he realized that it's hard to serve God when you've got unconfessed sin in your life. Amen. I mean, the biggest dud of a sermon that I'll ever preach is not the one that wasn't the deepest or wasn't the best organized or the one that didn't have any illustrations with it. The biggest dud of a sermon that I'll ever preach is the one I walk in this platform with unconfessed sin in my life and there's no power of God on me. That's the dud of a sermon. But David says, if I'm going to confess my sin, God, and I want you to cleanse me, and then I can consecrate my life to you again for your service. You'll ne you know what? You'll never be as happy as when you're in the center of the will of God. Amen. You know why we like Hell's Gate so much? I know you like to see people saved. Amen? Amen. But I tell you why we, what, one of the things that we like so much about Hell's Gates is you, you're never so happy as you are in the last part of October. Amen. You're tired and you're worn out. You know, and, and probably right about now, you're, you're dreading the thought of Friday and Saturday and Sunday night. You would say amen, but you can't. His voice is gone. You still just look as bad as you ever did, though, but <laughs> he can't get along to me because he can't. <laughs> Cole's got that, that, what are you supposed to be, a demon? Betty said amen. Right off the bat, Betty said amen. But anyway, you know what? We, we even dread the thought of it coming, but when it gets here, man. You know why we're so joyful? Because we're right where we're supposed to be, doing what we're supposed to do, and we know that God's hand's upon us, and we, we have the joy of the Lord. I start trying to prepare messages for November to pump you up. You know why? Because you'll go into a depression the second week of November. If I don't prepare myself, I'll go into a depression. You know why? Because we've been so pumped up about doing something for God that when it's done, we can be a little down. It's a good thing that Hell's Gates comes around and when it does because we've got Thanksgiving and Christmas to look forward to. Amen. But I'm saying you're happy because you've consecrated yourself to do whatever it took to do the will of God. But you don't have to do that three weekends, just, just three weekends a year. It doesn't have to be that way just three weekends a year. It can be that way 52 weeks out of the year. You can consecrate yourself to the work of God and you can find the joy of the Lord is always going to be there because it never gets any better than when you're doing exactly what God has called you to do. Amen. And you say, well, preacher, well, I'm not a preacher. Yeah, but, but you see, it's not just preaching. Consecrate yourself to be the husband that God wants you to be. Consecrate yourself to be the wife that God wants you to be. Consecrate yourself to be the parent that God wants you to be. Consecrate yourself to be the employee. That, you know what? If you're doing the will of God, you will have the joy of the Lord. Amen? And then you can say, as the Word of God says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen? It's right here how David lost it and how David got it back. I believe David is simply saying this, God, if you give me another chance, I'd love to serve you again. If you only knew how many times I got along with God and said, dear God, I've blown it. I thought, I thought this was gone. 
and I've blown it. God, cleanse me. Clean this stuff out of my life, out of my mind, out of my heart. And let me serve you one more time. Let me preach another message. Let us see another soul saved. Let me keep pastoring. And I watch God answer that prayer. My sin's forgiven. I know that. But God gives grace to the humble, and he resists the proud. And he needs me to get on my face and say, you know what, God, I know I did wrong there. I accused them precious young men back there of having a cell phone next to the soundboard. Amen. I need to get right, get right about that. Amen. Cleanse me, oh God, but don't take away my cell phone. <laughs> it's only smart about me. And I promise I'll consecrate it for you, Lord. I, I, it'll be used to take sermon notes, amen? And, and I won't judge other people. I know I'm being a little facetious, but it's an object lesson. What is it? This coming between us and being used of God. I know this, my friends, the greatest joy of my life is whatever I do in the will of God. And the thing that destroys my joy more than anything else is not doing something in the will of God. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, tonight, we've learned a lot about this man, David. I know, God, that you allowed him to go through what he did in many reasons, many ways, just for our, our learning, our admonition. God, I pray that you'd help us to be careful not to follow his path to lost joy. But God, also help us to regularly follow the pathway to restore joy. God, help us to confess and to let you clean out the things that shouldn't be in our life. And Lord, that we can consecrate ourselves for your service, for your will, to be what you'd have us to be and that you can restore the joy of our salvation. Thy salvation, Lord. I pray tonight, I don't know the condition of any person in this room, teenager or adult. God, I pray tonight for the individual that's gotten weary. Lord, I pray that they would confess that weariness and come back and... Lord, there's something that's cluttering up their life, worldliness. God, they're weak and they don't realize it. God, I pray tonight they'd come and draw near to you. God, there may be somebody in this room tonight that's just lost the joy of salvation. The thrill and the exuberance they once had is just kind of dimmed. God, I pray tonight they'd Take a step down the right path to restoration. Well, there's something for all of us here tonight, and I pray we'd learn it and receive it. Holy Spirit, we trust you to teach and to change lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Brother Tripp's going to lead an invitation song. This is your time to just to do business with God. As he speaks to your heart. I know it's real easy just to say, well, I got it. I'm going to go home. But if God spoke to your heart, this is the time for you to do business. Don't, don't, don't let the devil steal it away. He'll steal the seed away before it ever gets rooted. On this verse, would you step and come? Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God.